Hello everyone, thanks for joining me in worship here today. Let's get started with a call to worship from Psalm 67. This is Psalm 67. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you rule the peoples with equity and guide the nations of the earth. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. Let's worship. come to you as broken people. We come to you as people stuck in sins that we keep repeating. And we come to you not through our own righteousness, but through your sons. We praise you for your forgiveness. You have power over every sin that was, that is, and that will be. We ask that you'd assure us of your grace and love for us every day. Amen. Let's read from 1 John 2, 2, verse John, chapter 2, verse 2. He himself is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for those of the whole world. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear His voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. 
pray the words of Psalm 65. God of Zion, to, even you, to you even silence his praise. Promises made to you are kept. You listen to prayer, and all living things come to you. When wrongdoings become too much for me, you forgive our sins. How happy is the one you choose to bring close. Amen.
Hey, thanks for tuning in this week's online church message. Glad that you're here. I hope that uh, this new series that we're in, the classics, is an opportunity for you to maybe see the Bible in some different ways. We just finished up with the path, and now we're headed into this new series that I'm calling the classics. I feel like with summertime and the rest, it'd be kind of fun to do something a little bit different and to kind of bring back the, the stories that we heard as kids. Yeah, I think sometimes we keep some of the Bible stories in uh, kids ministry rather than actually spending some time in them as adults and so in this time through the summer I want to focus on some of those fun kids stories that we used to learn about but take them with a new twist to get a little bit more in depth challenge ourselves out of maybe what the story really says which is what I want to talk about here today uh, and we're going to start with uh, Noah and Noah's Ark as a matter of fact so we're going to be in Genesis 6 if you want to follow along in that but I want to really use the summer to to talk about what those stories really bring to light for us because I think sometimes we sit in them a different way we remember them as as we heard them as kids or as someone told us but do you really dive into what God's Word is on the idea of that and sometimes we keep these stories just in kids ministry which is wrong because there's a lot in them for each and every one of us to be able to learn and to glean from and so to set the tone for Noah's Ark I want to start with the fact explaining that Genesis 5 is really the genealogy that comes from Adam and Eve all the way through their sons to get us to where Noah is essentially. And so we, if you read Genesis 5, it talks about all these people that come after, that come from uh, Seth and, and their son Seth and others, and, and that genealogy that leads up to Noah himself. And we're going we're gonna to talk about that because we, we really want to understand that timeline of where it is when Noah comes into the picture. That last line in Genesis 5 says this, it says, after Noah was 500 years old, he became the father of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And so we know Noah at this point is really quite old. He's 500 years old. And this is where you, you kind of, people get a little off in that and understanding that when you read those genealogies, how people lived for hundreds of years longer than what we're used to and so we're going to address that here in a minute when we go through this next bit of scripture but this is where we enter into the story of Noah right in Genesis 6 and this is what it says in verses 1 through 8 and it says when human beings began to increase in numbers of the earth and the daughters were born to them the sons of God saw that the daughters of humans were beautiful and they married any of them they chose then the Lord said my spirit will not contend with humans forever for they are mortal their days will be hundred uh, will be a hundred and twenty years. The Nephilim, which are the giants, were on the earth in those days and also afterward. So when the sons of God went to the daughters of the humans and had children by them, they were the heroes of old, men of renew. the The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of human heart was only evil all the time. The Lord regret, regretted that he had made human beings on the earth, and his heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created, and with all them the animals and the birds and the creatures that move along the ground, for I regret that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. You know, a few things I want to talk about before we move on is one, it says, sons of God married human women. This is where you oftentimes lose people because in other places in the Bible, we, we try to figure out what that means. But when you look at the idea of the sons of God and you track that in where it's used elsewhere in the Bible, it's exclusively speaking about angelics. So it's talking about the angels. And we know that not all angels are good. So essentially, the angels were seeing how beautiful the women were, and they were basically having children with them. And so the union outside of what God had intended with Adam and Eve, he talks about in Genesis 2, 24, and it says, that is why a man leaves his father and mother so that he would cleave to his wife and they would become one flesh. So the second thing that stands out that usually loses people that I want to point out is how wicked the world had actually become. It says that every thought was evil. The idea that, that nothing was good, nothing was righteous, nothing was pure any longer, and God had regretted it. But then he says that a man named Noah found favor in the Lord. 
So one thing that really stood out to me is like how weird would Noah have to be compared to the rest of the world? I mean, when I think about it, how drastically different he would be from everyone else if he was in favor of the Lord and they were so evil, how he would stand out, how he was possibly a light for the Lord in such a wicked time because he chose to be obedient to the Lord. He chose to stand out by choosing the Lord over everyone else, choosing themselves or the rest. The contrast between him and the world, that really stood out to me. So sometimes you lose people in that because when you think about that, you get hung up on that. But he most likely was very, very different than everyone else out there. The third thing that really stood out to me that kind of loses people at time is this whole concept of people living for hundreds of years. And now the Lord is saying that no one will live over 120 years figuratively is what he's talking about and that's argued among all the scholars but is agreed upon that it's figuratively if you actually look in history and and people over the last couple hundred years there are a few that have lived beyond 120 years old but the scholars have argued through that it's very much like the book of proverbs when he speaks this it's not literally no one will live past 120 years it's figuratively that most people won't they also all argue essentially and agree upon that the 120 years is the idea that God is saying, you know, it's long enough for you to make a decision and decide if you're gonna choose to want what I'm offering or not. You don't need hundreds upon hundreds of years of wickedness to add to it. And so that those are, those are three things that sometimes people get hung up on when we travel through, but I want you to really focus on what it's talking about, that here is Noah, the world is wicked, and God is going to do something with Noah. And that's what we need to focus on here today. So as we get into the next bit, 9 through 22, those verses are going to be an account of Noah and his family. And this is what it says. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of the time, and he walked faithfully with God. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt and the God's sight was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become. For all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I am going to put an end to all the people for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I, sure, I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Some, some versions say gopher wood. Make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside and out. This is how you are to build it. The ark is to be 300 cubics long, 50 cubics wide and 30 cubics high. Make a roof for it, leaving below, leaving, leaving below the roof an opening one cubic high all around. Put a door in the side of the ark and make lower, middle, and upper decks. I am going to bring flood waters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens, even creature that has the breath of life in it. Everything on earth will perish. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you will enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. You are to bring into the ark two of the living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you. Two of every kind of bird and every kind of animal and every kind of creature that moves along the, the ground will come to you to be kept alive. You are to take every kind of food that is to be eaten and stored Store it away as food for you and them. Noah did everything just as God commanded him. So God told Noah to build this ark. And a cubic is about 18 inches long. And so when we look at those, those, those measurements and the rest, we'll talk more about them in next week's message and the idea of the ark and, the, and a lot of symbolism that comes out of the ark. But because he was going to send rain and flood to the earth, that's what God was saying. If you, you want my protection, you want to be saved and your family to be saved, you need to build this ark. And until now, Noah and everyone living there had, at the time, really had never seen rain. And it, the nearest body of water at this point, when you look on a map, was probably about three to 500 miles away that would be able to accommodate such a, a large uh, ship or boat. Essentially, it'd be the size of a cargo ship today. But look at the faith Noah had in building the ark. God tells us Noah had seven days before the rain even began to fall that him and his family sat in the ark. 
So Genesis 7, 1 through 4 says, The Lord said to Noah, Go into the ark and you and your whole family, because I have found you righteous in this generation. Take with you seven pairs of every kind of clean animal, a male and its mate, and one of every kind of unclean animal, a male and its mate, and also seven pairs of every kind of bird, male and female, to keep their various kinds alive throughout the earth. Seven days from now, I will send rain on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights and I will wipe from the face of the earth every living creature I have made. So as a result of his obedience, he and his family were spared from God's judgment. But think about this. There was no rain in the sky when God told him to get into the ark. That's really amazing to me to think about because there were no raindrops falling when God said, go into the ark. So Noah and his family literally obeyed the Lord by faith, by going in. And for seven days they sat there with all these animals, with no floodwaters and no rain, not understanding most likely what was going to come. And I wonder what a, what a trying that would be on a person's faith. You know, recently we had a bad storm and it knocked out our internet for a weekend. And, and you would think the world ended in my house with my kids because we had no, no internet. We, we couldn't do the things online that we want to do. We couldn't watch a movie. We couldn't play a game. We couldn't do these things. Well, in the end, we turn around and we play amazing games of dominoes and Uno and all of these other things to keep ourselves busy and become some of the greatest family time together. But think about your mind and sitting in that ark with all those animals for seven days questioning, did I hear the Lord right? Is this really what he said because that's what I feel like I would be in is like an hour in I'd be like man and I really hear the Lord because I think we're we're so out of understanding what it means to sit in the faith for a long term to be patient on the Lord to understand what the Lord is trying to do I'm sure that was a trying time in his faith and all those things going on and I I'm sure when the rain started to fall though how glad he was to be in that ark because this is this is this is a place in the story where people really start to muddy the waters and understanding for me. Normally I've been taught that for 120 years Noah had preached and warned them of God's judgment, all the people of the earth coming, and that they laughed and they ridiculed at him and they mocked him and all of these other things. But now Noah was safe in the ark and you know, the rest were being swept away by the waters of the judgment of the Lord and the rain began to fall and they probably started to begin to beat on the outside of the door and the rest has been taught to me. And there was Noah in faith, ultimately building this ark and the world was mocking him around there. And what are you doing, Noah? And are you crazy, Noah? And Noah you being ridiculed and laughed at nonstop. I mean, I, I'm sure that you probably have been told that story as well that way. But the problem is that you won't find that anywhere in the Bible, as a matter of fact. Not even a hint of it. You know, where in the Bible does it say Noah was mocked? You know, one of them knew. I met with some guys here this week doing some things. And one of them knew that I was, I was going to be preaching on this this weekend. And they, were, they read ahead and they, they, they essentially said that wherever they read... They were always told that Noah was mocked and ridiculed, but that when they read it, they didn't see that anywhere. And he shared that with me. And because of that, when I got home, I started looking that up and I started reading through the story itself because I had been told exactly the same thing. And in fact, if you consider Jesus's word here about Noah, um, it's most likely not the case at all, let alone even a hint. Because I think sometimes we we were taught that. I think sometimes we think that. I think sometimes we, we make that up in our own mind to justify things. But look at what Jesus says in Matthew 24, 37. He says, as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. And he's talking about his coming back and how people will be unaware because they're not prepared, they're not looking at, they're not obedient. It just becomes wicked in those things. The fact of the matter is that the people of Noah's days, they didn't realize what was happening either. And that's what Jesus is talking about. They were too busy with other things to really care 
even if they did. Because that's the point of Christ's words here, is that people, especially people who are ungodly, not focused on the Lord, get to a place where essentially, like, isn't it true with the people that we know in our life that don't believe in the Lord? They just don't care. They don't care about what's going on. They don't care about necessarily changing their life in it. There's there's even aspects of it where they could care less on on how things move forward and what the Lord would ask in all aspects. Now, are there those who mock God's people? Yes. I know, I know you know this to be true. Are there times that you're going to get mocked or have been mocked because you believe in the Lord? Yes. But the fact is that they were not mocking in the days of Noah. It should actually be an encouragement to us at some sense. I know as a preacher this is encouraging to me because there was Noah setting the Lord before the world in this form of the ark. He's saying, here is God. Look at what God can do. Look at what God is asking for. Essentially a picture of the Lord. I see it very much as like the first chapter of Romans when it when it talks about there's no, I, there's no reason for us to not believe in the Lord because when you look around at the beautiful creation of all the things that are around us, how can you not believe in the Lord? But if we really look at it, the world is just indifferent. They, there's so many people that don't care. It's not really a mocking and a and a ridicule, I've learned that it's really about like apathy rather than ridicule, which is pretty strange because when you look at it, the indifference of, of one of our, the, the indifference of life, apathy itself is like one of our greatest enemies. And it has always been this way. Hebrews eleven seven says, by faith, Noah, being warned by God's concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear constructed the ark for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness to that comes by faith. So if we're going to get a moral from Noah and his story, it's essentially that we must persevere through the apathy that we end up getting in life and what people have. So we do ultimately, if we look at if we look at our lives as we want to persevere through that and the rest, but but ultimately when we when we look at things in our faith and we people don't really care. Like those who don't believe in the Lord, they don't they don't really care whether or not we become the heirs of what Christ would have for us. They, do we get mocked? Yes. And I, and I don't doubt that plenty of us do continue to do that but, and have that in our lives. But more often, people just won't care about what we're trying to say because they're all wrapped up in what they're doing in life. But that doesn't keep us from battling through and persevering through that apathy that goes on around us. We still have to stand for what he's asking us to stand for. We still have to be a Noah and be willing to be obedient to go into the ark for seven days, whether we understand it or not. We do it because the Lord asks us to do it, because God cares. The world doesn't care if we're becoming those heirs, yet we still have to stand forgiven as we know we are when we give our life to Jesus Christ. So as humans, I think that we often desire to understand. We often desire to be justified in some things and some thoughts and want to know all the answer. And because of that, we have to be careful. Because we want to set our own a narrative to make the understanding. But we have to know God's thoughts are above our thoughts. His ways are above our ways. Think about right now if you saw this huge container ship outside your door. No water around. No, no body of water big enough to put it in. Just sitting there. You would want to know why. You would want to know what was going on. And you might even go and ask in the rest. And out of that understanding, we have to be careful because I think sometimes we will figure out to try to understand or even make things up not knowing it to try to have an answer in the end. But sometimes we say things to, to make that understanding come real to us that actually brings a lot of damage to people around us because we want them to understand. We want them to know. We want them to we want to be telling them the answers. We want to be sharing with them. But the fact of the matter is the story has to be told right. And that's really important. Now I think about 
we've lost babies in our life, my wife and I. And some people will say, well, you know what? Now they're an angel in heaven. That's, that's not true. I know they try to say that to comfort us. I know they try to say that to make it easy to, to think of something a little bit nicer in the tragedy of what we went through. But look at the impact of what that warps someone's perspective on the idea of our children. Like our, when we die, we don't become angels. That's not true. And I think sometimes in these stories, especially these kids' stories that were told to us out of the Bible as kids' ministry or the rest, that some little drama was added to make it a little better or uh, a little explanation to try to wrap our minds around it. I mean, think about cartoons. So the idea of this series being the classics, how many of you remember Looney Tunes? I remember in Looney Tunes when someone died, one of the cartoon characters, they were pictured with wings, angel wings, floating up and, and flapping their way to heaven in a white robe with a harp. <laughs> There's nothing in scripture that can support that and do that. But so many people think about heaven that way because that's what was shown to them. The more you dig into God's word and his teaching, the more that you get to see what the reality of it really is. You know, when we, we look at these, what I wanna share with you today is, is ultimately God's word is important to know and God's word is important to trust. And when we are in him, he protects us from the judgment of God that is going to come. <coughs> Excuse me, that, that bit that he did for Noah is an example for us to learn from. And we need to know it right. We need to know the truth behind it. Because the first thing I want to share with you today is that God's judgment is coming. It is in his word, it is guaranteed, and we get to see what his judgment looks like even before this with the flood. Genesis 6-7, it says, So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created, and with them the animals and the birds and the creatures that move along the ground, for I regret that I have made them. Look at Genesis 7-4, it says, Seven days from now I will send rain on the earth from forty days and forty nights, and I will wipe from the face of the earth every living creature that I made. You look at verses 10 through 12, and it says, After the seventh day, the flood waters came on the earth, the 600th year of Noah's life, and the 17th day of the, sec set of the second month, on the day that the springs of the great deep burst forth, and the floodgates of heaven were opened, and rain fell on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. Now, these verses show us that God had enough. He had enough of man's sin and wickedness and he was done, and he sent this flood of judgment. The flood demonstrates that even though God is patient, eventually his patience is going to come to an end and his judgment is going to come. See, God can't overlook sin forever. He can't, he can't wait on it to the end of time. He will decide when that time is. And there will be a time that his grace will run out. Sin has to be judged because God is holy and righteous. It can't just carry on. We read this because of man's continual wickedness and rebellion that God was going to send this flood of judgment. And that flood comes just as God told Noah. He kept his promise because we know him to be a promise keeper. We better understand that God does what he says because every time he's done what he said he was going to do. And just as he judged the whole earth with the flood, he will one day judge the whole earth again. And we need to be ready for that. If God says, if God says it, he means it and he's going to follow through with it. You know, the Bible warns us in the New Testament that judgment is coming again and the earth will be destroyed one more time. And he says in 2 Peter 3, 10 through 13, he says, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. So just like he sent the flood of judgment in Noah's day, God is going to send this judgment again, which is why we need to be devoted to him. We need to be committed to him and we need to be sharing him because we don't want our friends, our neighbors, our relatives to not be in heaven with us when we go. Look at the world today. It's business as usual. We can see 
plenty of people not thinking about the Lord and doing what the Lord has for them. The violence and the corruption, the wickedness is even, even more increasing. I've even heard people, it's the end times. Well, guess what? After Jesus died, I believe every day is getting us closer to the end time. So there's a reason we don't know. We can't just do what we want till the end of our day and then say, oh, now I know Jesus is coming. I'm going to give my life. We have, to, we have to truly believe in our heart. We have to confess in our mouth, which is our life. And we have to do that all the days of our life, continually looking at ourselves and getting rid of the things that he's asking us to do. Because God's judgment came quickly and swiftly. Yeah, Noah probably at some level with just who he was and how he lived his life, naturally through his actions preached and and essentially it was a warning to everyone for 120 years why he built the ark but when the flood, when the when the flood really came it came quickly and it came swiftly so this day just started like any other day but suddenly the waters underneath them burst up and the and the waters from the heaven poured down and it's, in some versions it even calls it the windows of heaven were opened and that means floodgates you look at floodgates as they're opened from a dam and there's nothing and then all of a sudden they open them and there's rushes of water. So in other words, this downpour of rain, it came out of nowhere and it lasted for 40 days and 40 nights. All because the people chose to have apathy and not realize God's judgment was coming even though it was right in front of them. And in the end, we look around and God, God's judgment of warning is coming. It's right in front of us. Are we choosing to accept it and to change our life and commit it to him now? Or are we just willing to go on and be merry and do what we want to do, hoping that we have time in the last minute to accept his saving grace? And the second point that really stands out to me in this is that God's judgment doesn't come without warning. You know, Noah knew God's judgment was coming. For 120 years, he knew it was coming. He walked with God, he testified by his conduct, by how he lived his life. But his witness for God was seen because of his commitment to God. If you really want to help people understand and warn them, they need to see you model it. They need to see it in the commitment that you have to the Lord. When Noah stayed committed to God in a difficult society, are you staying committed to God? in this difficult society, because God is going to return. We know that as believers, we have to know that and we have to trust that. And like Noah, we should be committed to him because God is going to return. We have to be willing to do that. We warn them by sharing the word of God with them. We warn them by telling them that God has provided a way of escape. And we warn them by sharing our own stories and how he rescued us and how he saved us and how he's he's written our name in the book of life so that we don't have to worry about the death that would come in the judgment of his return and we do that because we should want people to be there with us we do that because we truly love them as he loved us so do you take seriously God's return in your life or do you just play it off as it's not going to happen in my day? Do you keep it in front of you so that way you can witness to people, you can share with them how he changed your life and why he changed your life? Because we have to know that God's judgment is coming. We have to know that it's a serious thing because God does what he says. And we have to be willing to truly commit all of ourselves to him all of our days. And that's my prayer for everyone here today, that you would commit all of you to him because you know the judgment is coming. We see it, we, we know it, we read about it, and we trust in him being that promise keeper. Father God, help us. Help us to step out in that faith and commitment to you to do what you've asked us to do, Lord. To introduce people to Jesus, to help them follow him, that we would live our life in the things that we say that we commit to you in any area of our life that we have not fully committed lord lord let it not be corrupted and let it not be continued to head down that path lord let us take it with your strength with your conviction lord of, of us and overturn that in our life so that we can draw near to you lord lord we know that your judgment is going to come today and lord 
our heart should be for those who don't know you. Help shape it and mold it to do that. Help shape and mold our life to reflect you and your character, Lord, as Jesus. And help us to do that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks for tuning in to this week's message. Hope to see you next time.